What we are is really a category maker. We have invented the ability to understand people deeply through language. We are replacing recruiters in many of the organizations that we work with. Netflix and Amazon learn from your behavior. Our technology learns from performance in role. Actually also deliver business outcomes like reduced turnover. Welcome to today's episode of Future Work, where we explore the fascinating intersection of AI and human resources with Barb Hyman, the founder of Sapia. As companies like Starbucks, Randstad and Holland and Barrett begin to leverage AI for interviewing, Barb discusses how this decreases bias, increases diversity and makes the recruiting job a lot more joyful. We'll discuss the potential of AI in not just selecting the right candidates, but also enhancing the recruitment experience, unlocking learning and development opportunities, and boosting employee retention based on AI interview data. So let's dive in. Barb, thanks so much for being on all the way from the UK today. It's my pleasure. Great to have you. And I really just want to dive in and ask you about uh, Sapia. So this is your platform. You founded it, I think, about six years ago. Really curious about what it is, what it does, what part of current process it it replaces. And as I've been mentioning to people that I have you on the podcast, a lot of people have asked me, what makes Sapia so special in a, a pretty busy category? So I would love to hear a bit about the platform, basically. For sure. So Sapia.ai is a combination of two concepts, the homo sapien and AI. And that is really the core of what we're trying to do is to leverage clever technology, but in a very human way that works for the humans. What we are is really a category maker. We have invented a capability, which is the ability to understand people deeply through language. So we were working Mm. with language data and natural language processing way before November 23, when GPT was first launched. And what we're doing is bringing human-centered technology that is both fair and accurate to help DNA people for roles. Now, the way you would traditionally do that is through using a resume, which we all know is seriously flawed when it comes to evaluating people. You might do it through people, and we are also seriously flawed because many of our biases are quite unconscious. Or you might use a different kind of assessment, traditional assessment, We don't think of ourselves as an assessment because we're an interview. That's the category that we've built. And Mm. who doesn't get hired without an interview? So that's the space that we've occupied that we're trying to deliver a solution for. And sort of in that sense, would you mostly just replace an old school process of someone interviewing personally? And which kind of customers are most interested in this kind of solution Uh, at this point in time? I saw you have some really amazing logos on on your site already. Yeah, so if you think about hiring, you know, in an ideal world as a recruiter or as a company, you would bring to your hiring manager, who's really the ultimate decision maker, three Mm. star candidates, and they'd want to hire every single one. That's what we do. So we take from the point at which people apply to here's your shortlist of the best or the best three. That's what we do. So we're really displacing. Mm. We are replacing recruiters in many of the organizations that we work with or We're replacing recruiters in their traditional role of just doing screening and CV CV screening. And so you can use us as a fully automated apply to decide qualification process. And then always you have a human, which is usually the hiring manager that makes the final decision. But we're making sure that up until that point, everyone's had a fair shot at the opportunity. Everyone's received this incredible experience because they all learn from it. And the whole Mm. process is efficient and fair and actually very empowering for candidates. That's the difference between a chat as an interview or a video interview or playing a game. Hmm. Can you share a little bit about the technology that goes into something like this? It sounds incredibly complex. It may actually be one of those things where people say, oh, a machine could never do that. This always needs to be a human. So so how, how does an AI do this? Well, it's really quite simple in its conception, which is the best way to interview people, you know, and this is meta-analysis, academics that are validating this, is through a structured interview. A structured Hmm. interview is where a human would ask all candidates the same questions and measure them against a really clear rubric of what they're looking for. But the problem is we humans don't scale, and so we never interview everyone, and we certainly can't do that consistently and without bias. And so what we've built is a technology that does that for you. So it's built on the Mm. science of a structured interview, but the beauty is it's only five questions and those questions are allowing people to tell their story of who they are. 
and mm. everyone learns from that experience, right? The feedback is a really key reason why so many consumer brands use us. So that's the the genesis of it. And we didn't invent structured interviewing, but we've solved for hiring using using that science. In terms of the AI that sits behind it, it took us two years to build the product because the key mm. about this that makes it ethical, there are a number of elements, is the data that we use and the data that we don't use. So we had to test the questions. What questions will elicit the right amount of data with the right context for us to properly evaluate you? And mm. what is the data that we're using to build these models? And so we use our own data, which we call proprietary de-identified data that comes from now 3.7 million interviews that candidates have done in 47 wow. countries. And wow. all of our algorithms have been built based on that data. So we can evaluate mm. personality traits, the big five plus humility, as well as a whole set of competencies and really add any competency that you're interested in, as well as communication skills. And if you think about one of our clients is the largest BPO in the world, Concentrix, you know, how important communication skills is, mm. how important the right temperament is, and also competencies, the ability to do that in just five questions in one interview slash assessment is, you know, particularly compelling to move towards the right candidate fast. Okay, so if I understand it correctly, there's almost like a gold star way to interview someone and that's a structured interview where you ask a couple of questions and then because you ask everyone the same questions, you can be much fairer in how you compare the candidates that you have in front of you. Unfortunately, because humans don't skill, you wouldn't really be able to do it and you basically see in practice that most people just skip that step or only save that for maybe a few standout candidates based on resumes, which as you said already, are not really that great of a source of information. And so then basically the platform does that, you know, automatically at scale. And then how does it practically work? So first of all, like, tell me if I got that right. And then second of all, like, how does that practically work? Like, does an AI call me and say, hey, I heard you're interested no, no, in this it's job. All, it's all, it's, it's, <laughs> let's say you're in Workday. So you would apply through Workday and pretty quickly there would be a message that would say, you know, hey, Dan, we want everyone to be given a chance to work for our organization. Click here, it'll take you to a web browser you don't need to download and you'll start this experience. But the beauty mm. of chat dialogue is that a big part of what we're trying to solve for is what do I need to know in order to qualify myself into this role? So customers like Joe and the Juice have these awesome videos that showcase the role. They have people in the role speaking to the role. So it becomes a full mm. discovery process for both the candidate as well as the organization. So it ends up being a job preview experience mm as well as a job application and evaluation experience. Um, and that's the difference between chat as a medium and any other kind of tool is that it really allows both sides to engage and connect in a much more human way. It sounds really interesting. I'm really trying to kind of like build my mental image of, of how it works. But it sounds like, again, like if you had only one candidate and you wanted to put a lot of effort into making that almost like the best recruiting process, then this is exactly what you would do, right? You would share so in depth about the role and you would give them a sense for what it would be like also to give people an option to maybe self-select out if they feel like, actually, that's not me. I don't think I would be a good fit for the role. And then you would ask them all these questions. You would get that information and you would do spend a lot of time on that kind of analysis. And now basically the platform does it for, for people. You've completely nailed it. You know, the way we always think about designing the experience is what would the best recruiter do? What would the ultimate human yeah. experience be? And we try and build it around that. There's also another element that we're now adding to it as well, which is there's always an interview. And most interview scheduling processes are form filling via a mobile. And we want it yeah. to be something that's much more human. So this is where we're including generative AI, where it has a conversation that Effectively, the recruiter facilitates between you, the candidate, and the hiring manager as to when is the best time. But it's mm. much more human in the way that part of what we do in the chat, we always encourage our customers to add a section where people self-report their demographics. We do that for bias testing in the US, but also mm. because a big part of our platform is about the ability to increase diversity at the top of the funnel and maintain that through the funnel. And customers value all the reporting they get which allows them to see yeah. where are they getting their fair share of diverse talent, et cetera, hmm. is if you identified or self-identified that you're in a wheelchair, let's say you're someone with a disability, the interview advice to the hiring manager will say, don't forget Barb's in a wheelchair, so you need to meet her on the ground floor. Mm. Now, most wow. candidates feel like they share this data and it goes nowhere. So we're really yeah. trying to, again, that's what a human would do. They would remember that, they would note that, they would share that with you. 
The other piece that's really quite differentiated in market is that most AI is not AI. It is simple automation. We are yeah. a learning technology and how we learn is we track through our integrations with HRISs who leaves. And so we're able to identify that there wow. is a unique profile attached to those who are good, i.e. Mm. they stay in the role nine months, 12 months versus those who leave early. And mm. much like Netflix and Amazon learn from your behavior, our technology learns from performance in role and often time in role is a great proxy for performance. So we don't just deliver a really beautiful, efficient process for hiring. We actually also deliver business outcomes like reduced turnover. I think that's pretty unique. I don't think there are many AI tools which are really learning from data where we're mm. reaching models. There's always a human in the loop in that step, of course. It's not an automated process like Netflix, but that's where when you ask who do we go after, we typically see our product particularly valued by retail, F&B, you know, mm. contact centres, anywhere where there's high turnover because they're looking to solve for that as well as an efficient recruiting process. Interesting. I, I could have kind of imagined that the tool or the platform would definitely help in understanding which people that apply actually convert to being higher but the fact that you're tracking it through all the way to retention and then go backwards and, and optimize for that that's extremely powerful yeah i mean a holland and barrett which is a well-known retailer here they've seen turnover reduced by 30 percent in the first 12 months which for them is actually a cash cost saving because they invest in absolutely i think it's yeah. a level training for their sales staff yeah. to learn how to provide advice around vitamins etc so that's the kind of utopia for many high volume organizations mm. is how do we not just, you don't want to faster status quo, I call it. You don't want to just keep filling the seat with people that will leave. You really want to optimize for quality. And so that's that's a, an aspect of our tech that we're quite proud of. Absolutely. And it seems like something that this is really where the added value of the AI really makes sense because it's it's almost impossible for a human to do that. For sure, if I had someone that left, I would not go back to, hmm, what cues did I get during the interview? And I would definitely not do that at scale, right? If I'm, if I'm a Holland and Barrett. So that sounds extremely, yeah, extremely valuable. Yeah, and I think like recruiters often feel very intimidated by this because they worry about their mm. job security. But at the end of the day, we're solving for what they've always craved for. You know, like, tell me who's been great. Help me yeah. do my job better so I can hire for the right people. And so by mm. seeing this data as, you know, something that helps them do a better job um, mm. and they're spending a lot less time with many candidates, they're spending more time with fewer candidates, but most importantly, they're spending time in the business. Because I think yeah. the key thing that doesn't yet look like it's working in, in recruitment is what am I looking for? What's really matters for this role? And if they could be more of a talent advisor, rather than screening a thousand candidates based on their views of what great looks like, I think the organization will be better off and they'll have a better job. And to me, it's this is the whole promise of AI, right? You take the repetitive, boring, menial part of your job, you automate that away, you leave that to the AI, and then you can focus on the stuff that is interesting and that matters, which hopefully for recruiters is speaking to people and getting to know people and maybe spending a little bit more time with those candidates. We know from the PwC research that for most CEOs, recruiting is actually the number three biggest time waster in companies. They see it as extremely inefficient, I think, right behind email and meetings and I think procurement. So you have all these amazing customers already. As you're now going out and trying to sell it to new customers, what's kind of the level of readiness for this kind of solution? And is there any difference in whether you're talking to like a recruiter or maybe a CHRO? Is there any differences geographically maybe? What is it like to be selling this solution? Because it is very complex in a way. You can explain it simply, but in a way it's complex as well. What is it like to sell it into the market right now? We're a data company. And so we really go after mm. these organizations where they're hiring at scale. And we have found that retail is the most compelling prospect segment to sell into because there's no retail business that isn't using AI in their core business. So to, mm. to go from we use AI to decide on pricing or shelving positioning to then using it around people, you know, it's not such a big step. So mm. the market we see as, as an obvious target market for us. The other big segment that we go after is where we see a natural fit is we are really unique on experience. So as much as you say we're mm. automating and creating efficiency for the organization, I'm as equally passionate about how do you create a dignified experience for the candidate. And yeah. consumer brands where, you know, they spend a lot of money getting people in store, they care about that last meter of experience, they care about the experience candidates have because they know their candidates are their consumers naturally embrace this. 
So that's a much easier sell. You know, I'd say mm-hmm. that the segments that we don't find easy to sell into, which we don't spend a lot of time on, I think healthcare is very difficult. I think healthcare mm-hmm. has a lot of other problems and it's very hard to get them to shift. I don't see them as a segment that are fast followers in terms mm-hmm. of innovation, but, you know, consumer brands like Joe and the Juice uh who want to be the first global F and B brand that puts people at the core of their culture? Like perfect fit. Um, yeah. We talk about Sapi is the tool that brings you people that belong with your brand. So if you are mm. a brand, you care about people, you care about people experience, you care about fairness, you care about diversity. That's where we see a natural fit. That's amazing. We've discussed quite quite often on the podcast the link between CX and EX. I like this kind of additional layer that there's also like a word of mouth component to that, right? If I have fast food chain or Joe and the Jews, and I'm interviewing a lot of people, right? You know, maybe their experience, they'll share it with five or 10 people. That's all your consumers, right? Besides the people themselves. So it sounds like making impact there is, is really powerful. Can you maybe share a bit more of the candidate experience side of it? Because that was also the part that really excited me when I learned about this. This must be so much of a better experience for people applying for a job. I think a couple of Typical issues in the recruiting process are the black box syndrome, where I just, you know, I apply for a job and I I never hear back or I hear back really late, maybe not having any transparency in where I stand in the process. Are you getting any data back or any insights back from the candidate side in terms of whether they like it better, maybe through an MPS or or something else? Yeah, so we we track data, um, obviously being a data company. So we ask candidates when that once they complete the chat, to score it and leave verbatim, something like 80% of candidates leave verbatim, which is amazing. And then we analyze the sentiment and that sentiment is Mm. 95% positive. What do they like? It just feels comfortable, easy, unstressed. Mm. We have a 91% completion rate. We see that, we track that across all different groups, male, female, non-binary, ethnic groups, age, people who identify with a disability, and it's universally loved and trusted. I think for people who are neurodiverse in particular, we see Hmm. incredible engagement and response because it's not timed and it's blind. The fact that it's blind versus this, what you and I are doing, is Hmm. a world of difference for a lot of people. And we recently, not recently, but next week, we're releasing some research where we analysed across half a million candidates, half a million candidates globally, what the abandonment rate was for video interview versus chat interview. And it was two and a Mm. half times greater for women an abandonment rate perspective, right? So there are a lot of talent diversity you're going to miss out on if you don't choose something that people really trust and feel confident with. But the Just just because of the format. So the fact that I have to go and talk to a live person or even video versus chat, like those things really matter at a at a pretty big scale. They've lost Mm. you. Yeah. And so you can't afford to do that in a world where you've got unemployment at 3.7%, right? You need to appeal to the universe of talent. But I believe that people want to be heard, they want to be understood. They have a story to tell. And it's interesting how some clients initially almost sort of dumbed down candidates, particularly for retail roles. They mm. felt that they couldn't be bothered to complete yeah. this chat, that they'd yeah. rather just, I don't know, engage with a, a pretty simple dumb chatbot. But we don't see that. People want to share their story. Yeah. You know, tell us, Dan, what's the thing that's really brought you incredible, you know, happiness in your life? Or what's the best example that you can share of a team that you were part of? What did you love about that? It's like, it's your yeah. story. It's who you are. But yeah. because it's not a simple chatbot, because it's science, we understand mm. you and we give you feedback. So everyone receives their own personalized profile called My Insights, which is for your eyes only. And it gives you six insights and a coaching tip. And so we didn't realize it, but we effectively built a coaching tool almost by accident. And people frigging love this. They can't believe how accurate it is. They feel more motivated. They feel more self-aware. Mm. A lot of our customers are using that artifact in onboarding and in development. People share it on Facebook. They share it on <laughs> LinkedIn because most people are used to being, as you said, ghosted. And then the next thing that we're doing is apart from getting that to every single person who's interviewed, when you are rejected, because obviously no customer can interview, can hire everyone, is we also give you additional coaching at that point. So, Ran, Dan, mm. we're not to hire you, but we want you to keep learning. So we have all these insights about each individual that we're giving you back yeah. to help you, yeah. right, that you're not paying for, right? So you're getting free coaching using Sapien. So customers love that feature as well. Yeah. 
which is in a way just goes back to the idea of like what would the best recruiter in the world do or even a really good hiring manager would take the time to sort of do that debrief and say here's why we didn't pick you but I want to give you a little bit of feedback if you're open to it for maybe the next job application that you do again and now you can do it because you can do this at scale and so the, the candidates response is good to that too. Yeah, so we track, you know, how likely does this make you to recommend the company to buy their products and services? You mm. know, percentage of people who rejected will go on Glassdoor and leave positive feedback and we're talking in the 80s in terms of wow. employer brand advocacy and uh so it it has a huge impact on the employer brand. You know, a lot of our customers actually come from referrals from candidates, so Joe in the Juice is a great story. Mm. A candidate applied for a job at another customer, Walt, and loved it so much she told her brother, who happened to be really senior at Joe and the Juice, and the next thing you know, we're in a conversation. So there is this innate virality that comes from candidates doing it because they're just so delighted to to be heard and noticed and to learn from the experience. Yeah, that's a fantastic uh, growth engine. It sounds it sounds amazing. A- any downsides to this platform? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, the hard thing is that you know, there's a lot of fear around AI. You know, mm. I actually think that regulation is a really great thing because it creates mm. certainty and it puts some boundaries around how do you make the right decision. But unfortunately, there is a sort of a knee-jerk reaction to AI equals bias and people don't fully understand yet in HR, how do you do this responsibly? How do you do it ethically and what questions to ask? So I'd yeah. s- I feel like we're still very early in the AI maturity mm. curve, you know, globally. I think it's more evolved in the UK, to be honest, and the EU. I think that's a function mm. of standing regulation here around GDPR, which whilst it's not AI specific, it talks to the same concept, which is respecting people's rights. You know, AI, yeah. is just, AI regulation, the EU AI Act, is just another case of embedding principles mm. that respect people's rights, is transparency, explainability, et cetera. But in the US, you know, that's a market where I think because it's so litigious, there's a lot more fear around even thinking yeah. about it, let, it, let alone, you know, yeah, applying it consistently. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And there is some regulation being passed, right? So I think in California now, if you haven't been audited for the last year, then people cannot use your tool. But that's, again, like really specific to one state. So how do you see that developing in, in the US? Because obviously, it's still a big market for, for companies. Yeah, look, I mean, all regulation really comes back to the same principles that were really a foundation for us, you know, that we released a paper called FAIR, you know, what does it look like, FAIR AI and recruitment, and it's around validity, mm. the lack of bias, transparency, explainability. And part of what makes us so strong on those dimensions is, one, we don't use any human data, we don't use any third-party data, we only mm. use first-party data. So that makes it, you know, as a, at a starting point, very clean. The fact that we are also showing you the interview results so that you can see the data that's being used, that's what the user gets to see. And so you can easily review it as a human and compare it to what the AI does. That makes a very big difference. And that is really the the New York City law is really around transparency. Ironically, we've we built in real-time bias tracking based on the four-fifths when we first started in our dashboarding. And so we're effectively paying an independent auditor to do that mm. for the client that we do, you know, automatically for free. But that's that's the reality of, you know, having independent audits. So we're not, you know, that doesn't require any change on our part. I think it's just holding people's hands through it. Obviously, yeah. you know, I'm an ex-lawyer, so I'm pretty familiar with this stuff and take a keen interest in it. But you're really just going through a, a procurement conversation. And, you know, I find mm. a lot more interest in privacy is probably the area that takes up the biggest amount of time for, for customers is just feeling really confident about what you do with the data and what you don't. Yeah, and I'm sure that's going to be one of the big discussions as AI evolves further and as a lot of companies adopt AI more broadly, which is that where does that data go, right? Because we see tools all the time. And one of the questions we really have to ask is just even about our internal data. You know, what server is that going on to? What is going to happen with that data, right? Is that vendor ever going to have a data breach? And obviously, the moment you're talking about candidates' uh, information is going to be even more uh, sensitive, right? And I think brands are also very mindful of the fact that that's not a PR headline that you want, right? That, you know, so, you know, like your interview data or... To treat your customers' data and their candidate data because they own it as, as like the crown jewels, right? It's just, yeah. it's got to be embedded in your culture, yeah. You know, we invested in data sovereignty a long time ago. It's interesting to me how few HR leaders ask that question. You know, where is the data stored? And obviously, if you're working with enterprise, it has to be stored in country. Then they're still using tools that have data moving around the place that's stored elsewhere. So 
I think the fluency is increasing, um, but we've mm. always put at our core trust. You know, if you're trusting us, we take that very seriously. And so we need to be transparent about everything, including yeah. with candidates, what's going on. You know, we, we've invented new science really with what we've built and we we write it up and it gets peer reviewed in, in published research. And so we've effectively given away our IP because we think that increases trust between us and the and the customer. Definitely. Yeah. And you're continuing to build on that, right? So probably your, your competitive angle will be that you just out innovate everyone and that, you know, therefore you can share your current practices. What's coming up in the future? You recently launched uh, Sage, which is really more focused on the sort of like the life cycle continuing after recruiting. What's coming up? So Sage is pretty incredible. We were at NVIDIA. I wasn't, but our R&D team were, and they actually had a photo up with Jensen from NVIDIA, which nice. was pretty cool. But we were one of 44 startups invited to present there. And what we launched was the ability to now assess for any competency. So think about white collar, where you really want to dig deep on things like growth mindset, agility. Mm. Uh, we have the model of you know reinforcement learning through a human first. So we have a subject matter expert, typically an org psych, who will teach the machine what it means, growth mindset means at a very detailed level at what we call a facet. Mm. Then we have fine-tuned Llama 2. We chose that open source model and we fine-tuned it with our data. So we're now able to evaluate score, explain, and give insights. So think about, again, mm. what the best recruiter would do. They would say, I've interviewed Barb very deeply on all of these dimensions. Here's how she scores on each dimension. Here's why. And here's yeah. what it means for you in terms of whether you should put her in that position or not. You know, it's mm. it's like, goal. what recruiter gets the, you know, capability or has the capability to do that across all roles? And so we see this as very disruptive to the recruitment market it because if you think about a lot of hiring yeah. that is outsourced to recruitment firms disruptive to players like corn ferry you know where people mm -hmm. are assessing for competencies deeply but in a very kind of old old school experience um but it's the coaching for it you know i've always believed that you've mm. got to make a human and it, like no one wants to see an assessment without knowing what the so what is so be able to give live coaching about this is where Barb will really thrive. This is where she might struggle, mm. what you can do to support her. Like that's what makes it human. You're meeting the the hiring manager where they are. You're really helping them, guiding them on making the right decision. Because you're picking up on a lot in that kind of interview recruitment process that you can also apply as someone goes into that role. And again, based on our data and where we've seen the best people do really well, how can we coach them further? And that's so that's the development part then. So you see sort of the platform building out to kind of like to that end. That's right. And we'd love to also be able to offer this capability in a in a white label way. So, you know, we mm. see ourselves as continuing to build the business from a direct customer point of view, but to be able to embed this capability in, you know, job boards and CRMs, mm. anywhere where you're wanting to understand talent and know what you know, what are the circumstances that are going to set this person up for success? Like it's the ultimate business partner yeah. capability that we've built. So we're very excited about that. And I think we're we're pretty well advanced relative to others. We also last year, year built our first large language model using proprietary data to detect cheating. So if you're completing okay, that nice. interview and you're going to GPT, we can say that live, hey, it looks like you may have sourced your answer from artificially generated content, do you still want to submit or do you want to edit? And that's pretty game changing to, uh, from a behavior perspective. Yeah, which again, is, is fine because probably once you once you start doing the job, you'll use ChatGPT too, but it's kind of nice to get at least that feedback so that you don't submit the same answer that everyone else does. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. I mean, it sounds really fascinating to me, definitely eager to, uh, to learn more, but we are at the end of the time. I want to close out with maybe one wish that you have for the future of work. Look, I think where technology is going is it's about AI that gives people agency, you know, mm. so it's fear of AI that weaponizes your data or AI that is used by someone else to your detriment. I think what's so exciting about conversational AI is it's giving you agency and it's helping you shape yeah. your career and you own your decisions. And I think that mm. power in the hands of the individual is incredibly motivating and it's really what's going to drive towards the ultimate goal in hiring, which is, you know, retention. Sounds, sounds amazing. Okay, Barb, thanks so much for being on today. My pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us today as we explore the innovative frontiers of AI in recruitment with Barb Hyman, the founder of Sapia. Today's discussion unveiled several critical insights into how AI is reshaping the hiring landscape and HR as a whole. Number one, the role of AI in recruiting. 
We learned that AI can dramatically enhance interviews by replicating a five-star recruiting journey at scale, starting with a structured interview. It also makes interviews less biased, more enjoyable for the candidate, and the start of a data-driven employee journey that leads to improved retention. Number two, bias and diversity. Giving more candidates a universal interview experience leads to more people being considered for a role, blind to demographics. Additionally, even something seemingly small like using chat versus video or in-person interviews leads to more women applying. Number three, data-driven insights for retention. Our discussion also highlighted how AI could use performance data to predict long-term job success, thus improving retention rates, like Holland and Barrett saving money with 30% improved retention. And number four, ethical AI use. Addressing AI skepticism through ethical practices was a significant point in this discussion. Promote transparency in your AI implementations and engage in open dialogues about the ethical use of AI in your hiring practices to build trust and acceptance among stakeholders. Also keep in mind where the data from candidates sit and increase your fluency in understanding the privacy elements of AI. I finally love Barb's point of view about AI giving people more agency, which is a very positive view for the future of work. So that's it for today. Subscribe for updates at flexos.work slash futurework.